my great pleasure to introduce Amir Filipovic for the distinguished uh, lecture this year. Uh, you can see that I have this paper in my hand, which is a CV of uh, Damir. Uh, you okay. can this through probably down in my talk, but I will not do that. Uh, I only brief, briefly mention the achievements of Damir. Uh, Damir holds the uh, Swiss co chair of uh, quantitative finance at the uh, EPF in Lausanne, the Federal uh, uh, Institute of Technology in, of Switzerland in Lausanne. And he is uh, the director of the uh, uh, Swiss Finance Institute at EPFL. He's, uh, uh, he's also a Swiss Finance Institute uh, senior chair. Uh, he holds a PhD in mathematics from ETH Zurich and has been a faculty member of the University of Vienna, the University of Munich, and Princeton University. He also worked uh, for the Swiss Federal Office of the Private Insurance as a co-developer of the Swiss uh, Solvency Test. So uh, I knew a little bit more about this Swiss Solvency Test, which is the uh, uh, regulation framework in Switzerland for insurance, which is something that uh, uh, motivated a lot of research, including some of my own and many other researchers. So that's really a, a very uh, important uh, achievement that he had done. Um, uh, at the same time, I noticed that from his CV that he got his PhD from Zurich in uh, 2000, and merely after four years, he became a full professor at the University of Munich. So that's been really something that was quite impressive. Uh, he has published over um, many different top journals, including the Journal of Finance, the Journal of Financial Economics, the Annals of Applied Probability, and of course, many other journals more related to actual science, like Insurance Mathematics and Economics, uh, European Actual Journal, Austin Bulletin, and as well as the uh, top journals in Mathematical Finance, like Mathematical Finance, and Finance and Statistics. So uh, it's really an impressive uh, record of uh, publication. Um, so now, without uh, further uh, Delaying the talk, I will give the floor to uh, Damir. All right. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Rodu, for this nice introduction and for having invited me to give this lecture. I feel distinguished indeed. Uh, uh, and you see, I, I worked hard to prepare. Uh, it's, 80, it's 86. So uh, you know. Uh, the idea is, I'm, I'm not frightening you here. I mean, uh, I just want to say um, there is a lot of uh, stuff done uh, currently. I mean, the topic is, of course, a hot topic uh, as well, not only in computer science in general, but also in, 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 uh, in uh, quantitative finance these days. Uh, I prepared quite a bit. Uh, the material will be available to you. Uh, online. Uh, I will not discuss all these uh, slides. There is a lot of appendix material here, details. Some of them I will skip during, during my presentation. So uh, don't panic and just be uh, aware that uh, you can find this uh, material online. All right. Um, so it's about the machine learning approach to uh, portfolio risk management. I should be more precise. It's, it's a machine learning uh, uh, using uh, kernels um, and uh, to uh, you know tackle a problem that I basically encountered first in the context of insurance. Uh, this is the problem of the replicating portfolio. So we have an asset liability uh, portfolio of uh, let's say a life insurer. It consists uh, of uh, you know many uh, contracts uh, and 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 contains many options. And uh, the final cumulative cash flow is, is highly path dependent and depends non-linearly on, on many factors. So um, that's a situation we are well familiar with in, in the actuarial uh, science uh, world. Uh, and, and of this portfolio, you have to now determine uh, economic capital, right? So uh, economic capital is a function of the one-year loss. So it's the first year loss. It's the distribution of the of the first year loss under the under the P measure, under the objective measure, and then you apply some expected shortfall or value at risk or whatever is your favorite risk measure or your regulator's favorite risk measure. And and you know very well that this this leads us uh, in, in a naive approach to to a highly computationally over expensive nested Monte Carlo simulation problem. And, and so, you know, and there are, of course, smarter ways to do. Well, 
I mean, one way to do is, of course, you could do you could develop smarter methods for Nancy Monte Carlo. Uh, what, what what we develop here is is actually something based on kernels, right? Um, and so so this is you know what this lecture is about. We develop a, a computational framework for this uh, problem, and and more generally, of course, this doesn't apply only to life insurance portfolios, but can actually be applied then to any uh, portfolio that you may encounter in, in, in finance and insurance. Um, it is based on the replicating martingale. That's kind of you know, a slight extension of the notion of a replicating portfolio. I will define it in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the idea then is to approximate and learn this replicating martingale from a finite sample. And this is what you know, entitles to, to call this machine learning, because learning from examples is machine learning. And again, this is done in conjunction with using kernel methods and the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Right? And, and so in that context, you know, uh, we, found, we found it worthwhile to, well, first of all, ourselves, uh, myself and, and my, my, my co-authors, I mentioned two of them here, my PhD student, Lotfi Budapsa from EPFL, and Lucio Fernandez Arjonia from Zurich Insurance Company and the University of Zurich, where he's currently doing a, an executive PhD. Um, so worthwhile to dig into the literature uh, that is, of course, abundant uh, nowadays in, in machine learning, especially in context with, with kernels. But, you know, still find, find kind of a rigorous way of implementing these methods for our specific computational finance task here, which is, in the end, a simulation-based approximation of functions, as we will see. Okay? So, uh, so what are the main results that I will show you in the, in the following um, um, 50 minutes or so. Uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, the, the, the machine learning with kernel that I will show you here, you know, outperforms the naive brute force Nessi Monte Carlo estimation. Of course, uh, that, that was to be expected. Uh, but, you know, there's a bit more of it uh, behind. Uh, we, we use what is called the representer theorem. That's something that is, that, is, that is used in the context of reproducing kernels. Uh, and we will use this uh, to, to basically achieve closed form expressions for the conditional expectations that we will need. Um, and, you know, having that uh, framework set rightly, uh, we will be able to derive uh, bounds on the, on the errors, right? So because we will estimate um, our, our functions, our replicating martingale, we will be able to provide uh, bounds on the mean sample error. Uh, uh, I will show you limit theorems in function space, uh, like, you know, law of large numbers, central limit theorem, and also give you uh, finite sample guarantees. So we will find uh, uh, finite sample arrow tail distribution bounds. Um, and then I will show you at the end some, some uh, you know, first simple examples that we, that we used to implement here for, for the sake of this paper, uh, um, uh, uh, which show, you know, good quanti qualitative, qu quantitative results uh, for a relatively small training sample size. And then I propose uh, a weighted sampling scheme that will further improve uh, the results. Okay, so here's an outline of the talk. I will first be introduce the, the kind of the motivating problem, which is very much coming from insurance, as you will see, uh, the replicating martingale problem. That then motivates uh, the introduction of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces that we will use for approximating uh, uh, our target function and then show you how to use a sample-based estimation uh, and then, you know, eventually give, give the applications, you know, going back to the original problem uh, and giving you some, some applications in more detail, okay? All right, so here is a financial model that, that, that you know, serves as, as a motivating uh, framework, right? So we consider an economy with a finite time horizon. Uh, randomness is modeled on the probability space, and the Q is the measure that is used for pricing. It's the risk-neutral uh, uh, pricing measure. Uh, values and cash flows are discounted by some numerator. And, you know, randomness is driven by a random driver process that I call X. Right? X is a, is a stochastic process in discrete time. Think of X as being the discrete time Brownian motion. Right? It's a discrete time Brownian motion. Uh, it has a very simple, nice uh, distribution. Okay? 
Um, and everything that complicates things will stem from nonlinear functions of this uh, simple distribution. Now, this, this random driver process generates a filtration, kind of the natural filtration of the Brownian motion, and, and we will be, you know, dealing with the task of computing conditional expectations with respect to this, this filtration. Uh, the, as you can see, you know, everything, you know, the Q measure, the pricing measure plays the dominant role here. It's about pricing. Nevertheless, I mentioned there is the physical measure, the P measure that we will potentially then use to uh, measure risk like, you know, the one year P and L. So, and then, you know, as an object, you know, consider a portfolio. Uh, like an asset liability uh, portfolio of a life insurance company whose present value is not directly observable, but it has to be derived from its cumulative cash flow by, uh, by this terminal time point capital T, right? And so this cash flow is a function of the random driver process. Um, and, you know, in the context, again, of a, of a life insurance portfolio, we typically consist of, you know, of a sum of, of annual cash flows that, that is, you know, progressive uh, in, in the filtration, adapted in the, to the filtration. Um, so examples, you know, these insurance liabilities, but then, of course, more generally, any financial, any option uh, that on, written on stocks, let's say, and or, you know, uh, more structured products, uh, mortgage-backed instruments, et cetera, okay? The goal is to compute the conditional expectation of this cumulative cash flow uh, for any time small t, right, which, which gives rise to a martingale. I call it the replicating martingale. So mathematically speaking, we're looking for the martingale whose terminal value is equal to f of x, okay? And in the financial context, you know, this martingale is the gains process of the portfolio, right? Because it's the sum of the cumulative cash flows up to time t plus the, the current spot value of the, of the, of the remaining um, of the remaining cash flows, okay? So that, that's the object, right? So why is that important, uh, this replicating martingale? Well, because it's the gains process of the portfolio. It can be used for, the, for uh, you know, all kind of uh, risk management tasks, like risk measurement, right? So we look at the annual uh, uh, loss, P and L, and you know, want to measure, let's say, uh, expected shortfall or value at risk of that. Uh, we can also uh, apply, you know, some hedging. Uh, we could we could find, you know, by by basically modeling uh, uh, in parallel the gains processes of some tradable financial instruments called MG. This is a vector of gains processes, i.e., uh, martingales again under the risk neutral measure. And suppose you know we then we then just find a. a, a, a uh, uh, an optimally hedging strategy that tracks these, uh, these gains process, uh, these replicating uh, uh, martingale V. Uh, this could be done, e.g., by you know, variance minimizing strategy. And again, that boils down to computing conditional expectations. Right? So everything boils down to compute conditional expectations. And by the way, you know, this is, of course, a universal framework for financial models, at least in discrete time. And this could host uh, you know, gauge type processes and, 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 you know, whatever you like, okay? So, now, this is a very useful uh, uh, object, is uh, 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 replicating martingale, but then, of course, the question, you know, now is how to compute the replicating martingale subject to, well, lack of an analytic expression, right? We do not have analytic solutions here anymore. F is a function that, you know, we can, Evaluate. We assume we can evaluate it trajectory-wise, but you know it's too complex in order to be basically grasped as, as, as a nice analytic function or an analytic object, so that we could just easily write down what the conditional expectation is. Uh, so we have to go via some you know simulation-based approach, uh, and 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 but you know everything that we face here is with respect to the limited computing budget. Because, of course, otherwise you could always say, you know, assume you have high performance computer available and then, of course, every problem is just feasible by just brute force computing. Now, we should keep in mind, right, so we want to have a solution that can run on potentially on the desktop, i.e., you know, under some limited computing budget within a reasonable time. Okay, so that's the challenge. All right, so that's the naive brute force approach would be nested uh, Monte Carlo, 
right? So this is a typo. This should be vt here, right? So we have the, you know, for any time little t, yeah, we would have to uh, simulate a certain number of outer samples, and then for each outer sample, again, in order to, to, to determine the conditional expectation at this, at this scenario, we would have run, to run inner samples uh, at, to, in order to get one, one outer sample of the, of the replicating portfolio <laughs> at time little t, and that obviously just exponentiates in, in, in computing um, cost. Especially if we, are, if we were to do it not just for one given time little t, but actually we would want to do it for any little t, which, you know, as I said, is potentially of interest if, let's say, we, would, we were to uh, find a, a replicating uh, strategy or, you know, an optimal hedging strategy. We would not only need to evaluate uh, this replicating mart martingale at, at, at a fixed time horizon, but at, you know, dynamically in little time t. So this is not feasible. So this is the machine learning approach that, um, that, um, that we propose here. So, uh, so let nu dx denote the distribution of the random driver under q. Again, right, think of x as being Gaussian white noise, let's say. But it's not, it's not a priori restricted to that. But you know, that's what we should think of x about. Uh, and nu is therefore, you know, it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution on Rd times t, right? So we assume we have a d-dimensional Brownian motion in, 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 in capital T time steps. So uh, the machine learning approach consists of two steps. The first step is we approximate the true function, the target function, by some function that I denote f lambda here, where lambda will play the role of a regularization parameter. And you know, we will pick this f lambda such that its conditional expectations are given in closed form. Okay? So then the, you know, the computational task is solved, right? At least for f lambda. Uh, but we do not know f lambda. We will know f lambda only in theory. We will have to uh, basically uh, estimate f lambda. We will do it from, you know, from a finite sample. Finite sample, I denote it by bold face x. This is a sample. These are n independent copies of x, along with the values of f. And we will then learn uh, f lambda. That gives us a sample estimator. The sample estimator will have the property that inherits this. It will inherit the property that the conditional expectation is given in closed form. right? And then we, we, we will use this you know, as, as, a, as an estimator for our replicating martingale. Okay. All right, so we approximate f and then learn this approximation from a finite sample. And this finite sample estimator will have the property that these conditional expectations can be computed in closed form. OK, that gives us the replicating and an estimator for the replicating martingale. Now, why is that a good estimator of the replicating martingale? Well, fx, the, the, the sample estimator, will be close to f in L2, OK, in L2. So this norm here will be small. And, you know, and then you know, uh, using the martingale property of v uh, and v hat, um, you know, along with the measure change potentially, right, tells you immediately in conjunction with Dupes inequality for martingales that the pathwise maximum in expectation, I mean, the, I mean the, 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 the pathwise uh, maximum of, of the difference, uh, 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 absolute difference of the absolute error uh, under the P measure, we first of all, we can, uh, we can control upper bound by the L2 norm of the, of the Radonikonim derivative. We can always assume this is finite uh, by, by appropriate uh, specification of the market price of risk. You know, and then here we have the L2 norm of the of the, uh, of the pathwise uh, uh, maximal error. And that is, as I said, you know, by Dupes inequality, we can bound by two times uh, the L2 norm of f minus fx, which again then we decompose into approximation error and sample error, right, uh, as we are familiar with uh, from, you know, um, from other um, you know, applications. This gives us a, a device to basically trade off bias and variance. Okay. So that's the program. Therefore, so we first will uh, 
learn about what is this approximation f lambda, and then we will learn how to basically uh, learn this approximation from a finite sample, right? And we will have to control both of these of these error, this approximation error and the sample error. So this will be the content of the following two sections, okay? First approximation, and then the sample est estimation. Okay, approximation. As I said, this is going to build on the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, and so I give you a brief overview of the these uh, kernel methods, right? I mean, these are these are a bit more than 100 years old. James Mercer and Stefan Bergman. Uh, were among the first to study integral operators related to kernels. And then only in 1950, there was, the, the, you know, there's this seminal paper by Aaron Schein uh, that, is, that is really giving us a basic theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And then again, for a long time, it was quiet, and then the machine learning community rediscovered you know, Boser et al., this includes Wapnik, you know, known for the support vector machines, Shulkov and Smola, and others, right, uh, basically rediscovered these reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces or these kernel methods for, you know, for, you know, for nonlinear classification and nonlinear PCA, right? Um, and then, you know, interestingly, you know, that, that typically works, you know, with compact domains. Um, now, we have a Brownian motion, you know, I mean, Gaussian white noise is not on a compact domain, so we would need that whole thing on non-compact domains. It's remarkable that only 2005, and then, you know, by, later by other authors, right, which, which provide a systematic functional analysis of kernels on, on these general domains. Okay, and then you know there's a, there's a, there's there's of course an abundance then of, of 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 papers, and this this list is by far not covering all of them, but for us uh, uh, most influential uh, were papers by by De Vito and Rosasco uh, uh, and co-authors who connect the theories of statistical learning that ill pose problems via. Tikhonov regularization and study convergence of the integral operators using concentration inequality for Hilbert spaces. So, so we, 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 you know, this is quite close to, to what we are doing. We learned a lot from their from their papers, uh, but you know we are certainly the ones to give to give the application in, in, in the financial in the financial or insurance context uh, the, the way I outlined it at the beginning. Uh, there is a bunch of uh, modern textbooks, very good textbooks, among others, you know, the book by Bishop, and then Cooker and Zhu, and then Hoffman et al., which is a survey paper, which is uh, actually um, uh, Shulkov, Smola, Hoffman, and then Paulson and Rakupati, only 2016, for instance. I mean, this is a very, it's, it's an active field, it's, it's, and it's a beautiful theory. Uh, it's elementary from a functional analytic point of view, but it's just, you know, that makes its beauty, and so therefore I think it's worthwhile. I spend a few minutes now to, to recap uh, what this is all about, okay? So here, you know, here is, a, here is now following up on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the financial or insurance motivating example. Uh, uh, we are now basically uh, abstracting a bit from it. What I take from that introductory example is that, you know, we have a we have a, a, a domain, which is, which is the domain, which is the range where, where the, the random driver process lives, x lives, right? In the case of, of, the, of the application that we saw, this, is, this would be, uh, you know, uh, the rd times t, okay? And, and, you know, and remember, we had the distribution of x under q, which we denote by nu, and then, of course, we have a sigma field here. So we have a probability space. We have probability space. On this probability space, we have a target function. This is our cumulative cash flow function or payoff function, right? This is just an L2 function, okay? And the goal is we want to approximate f by some f lambda coming from a hypothesis space, right? The space that consists of functions that, that we understand very well that have nice properties, okay? Uh, well, and for this hypothesis space, convenient choice is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, what is that? Well, um, here it is in a nutshell. Right, first of all, let's start with a kernel. A kernel is a function in, 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 in two variables, right? 
uh, it's, a, it's a function on the product of E with itself, uh, real valued with the property that you know for any finite selection uh, uh, of, of points in E, you know the n by n matrix um, that you get is positive semi-definite. That's a kernel. Any function with these properties is a kernel. All right. Then, on the other hand, you have, a, you have a, the concept of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. What is that? It's a Hilbert space of functions. It's a, it, so it consists of functions on E, again, real valued. Uh, that's enough for our needs. I mean, this can also be Hilbert space value, but you know, real valued, this is what we consider here. Uh, this is a, a, a Hilbert space of functions with the property that the pointwise evaluation is a continuous linear functional. Okay? So that means L2 is not a reproducing kernel Hilbert space because L2 is not a space of functions. L2 is a space of equivalence classes of functions, and we cannot pointwise evaluate them. And, and, and um, you know, so it's even void to speak about whether this is a continuous linear functional. But, <clears throat> but the Sobolev space, for instance, uh, could be uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So it, it has to consist of functions. Pointwise evaluation is continuous linear functional. And, and so it can be represented by Ritz theorem by an element in, in H again. Let's call this element Kx. Uh, and then, you know, we pair Kx and Ky. We get a function in X and Y. And then it's easy to check that this is a kernel. And this is called the reproducing kernel uh, of this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And now there's a connecting theorem which tells you that for any kernel there exists a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay? That's beautiful. Okay, now these are very convenient. Uh, so therefore, uh, because any choice of kernel, therefore, always gives you a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. We do not really know its scalar product, but we know at least how, well, we know at least how these elements kx pair with element with functions in H. That's enough. Um, okay, for the sake of, you know, that's just a recap, right? Compact operators and Hilbert spaces. There's a notion of Hilbert-Schmidt operators. There's a Hilbert notion of trace class operators. Um, and non-negative self-adjoint compact operators admit a spectral representation. I'll let you look 10 seconds at that. And then so you, okay, that's, that's, that's somehow the main ingredients that we will need for doing the proofs of what I, what I show you. But you need to understand that Hilbert-Schmidt operator is, is one um, that uh, well, that basically, again, gives rise to a Hilbert space. It gives rise to a Hilbert space of operators, right? The Hilbert space of Hilbert-Schmidt operators is, 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 is a Hilbert space, and, and it has an inner product. And we will use this inner product from time to time. All right. Now, back to our uh, problem. We have a target function f. I, and I assume it is square integrable, so it's an element in L2. Strictly speaking, its equivalence class is an element in L2. We want to learn this function uh, through the choice of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is the same as the choice of a kernel. So let's choose a kernel. Let's assume the kernel is measurable. And let's assume its reproducing kernel Hilbert space is separable. This sounds harmless, but it's actually highly not true. <laughs> but there are sufficient conditions for separability. No worries. Um, then, you know, you can easily show that H consists itself of measurable functions. Um, we then uh, denote by kappa the, the, diag the square root of the diagonal of the kernel. This is a function that we will encounter all over and over again. Um, it, well, it's easy to see that this kappa here is the norm of, of the element kx. And it has the nice feature that you know the pointwise evaluation um, of, a, of, a, of a function h in h is bounded by you know kappa x times the, the norm of h. That that follows 
directly. Now we assume that kappa is square integral. Now, when kappa is square integral, then h is square integral for any h in h. I mean, more generally, when kappa is in LP for any p, then h is in LP for any h. Okay? That follows from this. So we assume it's in L2, so we define the operator J, which is kind of the canonical embedding of H into L2. So it identifies, so it maps H, a function H, onto its equivalence class with respect to the measure nu. Okay? So J, the J operator. We will, we will use this now over and over again. Then, you know, there is an, you know, there is a first uh, uh, basic properties uh, of this operator. It's Hilbert Schmidt. Its norm is just the L2 norm of kappa. Now, what is or a more interesting object is the adjoint of J. Now, the adjoint of J, which maps L2 to H, is given in this form. Uh, and that's, that's going to be, well, that's essentially the representative theory, as we will see, for those who have heard about that. Um, so that's, that's J star of G. Okay, so here, you know, here's a diagram, right? So we have J, which is, a, which is just the canonical embedding into L2, and you know, there's an adjoint to J, which is J star. By the way, the proof of this one is, is uh, the sketch of proof is, is really elementary, straightforward, right? So here's J star of G, we have a in X, so that's the same as the, as the pairing in H, right, of J star G with, with the element KX, and then we drop the, the J star on K here, get rid of the star, and then we end up with the L2, uh, you know, in a product of JK, which essentially is K itself, uh, with G, and that's what is written there. Okay, so, now, okay, so, so this, uh, the, the composition now of, of J star with J, uh, gives rise to an, an, an operator on L2, an integral operator on L2. Here is this integral operator on 2. It's non-negative, self-adjoint, trace class. Therefore, it has a spectral decomposition. Actually, the spectral decomposition that I show you here, you will not see anymore in the sequel of the talk because this is used in the proofs of, of, of the you know, some, of some of the results in the sequel of the talk, but so it's, 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 it's good to see. Um, that you know that this is this is this is the technique that is used. Uh, what is more interesting here is that you know, and, and more important is that you know uh, J J star, which is a trace class operator on L two. You know, this is invertible, of course, if and only if the kernel of J star is zero. But also, it, that the dimension of L two has to be finite, right? Because otherwise, a compact operator is never invertible. Otherwise. Uh, unless the, the, the unless the space is finite dimensional, uh, this is going to be the case often, as we will see in the sample part, because in the sample part the measure nu will be replaced by the uh, by the by the empirical measure, uh, and so the, the L2 space there is is finite dimensional, right? And so this this will of, this will often apply. Good. So that's J J star that gives rise to integral operator on L two. But of course we can also we can also compose J with J star, and that gives us a, an integral operator on H, right? Now it turns out that you know this this is a this is a very well known fact in functional analysis. This has the same positive eigenvalues as as as, as its brother, uh, uh, and and you know the same you know applies here. Uh, about invertibility, you know, again, this, this would be invertible if and only if H is finite dimensional and J has a, has a zero uh, kernel. Now, is the choice of H finite dimensional, is that a good choice? Well, often this is a choice made, right? And, and you know, any choice, I'm, I will show you examples. Okay, so H can be, you know, depending on the choice of the kernel, H can be finite dimensional. All right. Now, that's what I said. We now want to approximate f, right, by some element in H. And what we do is actually we, we project f on H in a sense, right? Uh, but, you know, um, this projection is, uh, of course, not always well defined, especially when, when H is uh, infinite dimensional. Okay? Um, 
so I mean, when I say well-defined, I mean really that the minimum is attained. The infimum is, of course, always attained. This is a complex <laughs> problem. But I want the minimum, right? We want to have a function in H that solves that optimization problem. So if, you know, in general, right, uh, this will not be well posed, but so we regularize it. We add a penalty term, lambda times the, the H norm square. Okay, so here is a figure, right? So, so f is our target function in our target space L2. It's a, ve it's a vector in the target space L2, and so a subspace is H in a sense, right? It's embedded, and now we could either project it on H, that gives us f naught, or we regularize, that gives us f lambda, which is basically resulting in a shrinkage towards zero. And, and it's f lambda that we will learn from the finite sample. So I already indicate here that you know, the, 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 the sample error distribution will be there. Okay? So that's, that's the picture. So why do we add this penalization term? Well, again, because in general this is not well posed. Uh, that, you know, that amounts to what is known as Tikhonov regularization, right? Because it it, it, it turns out that you know, well postness is, is, is equivalent to the invertibility of J star J, which would require H to be finite dimensional in the first place. Uh, if H is not finite dimensional, we have to add a non-zero lambda. Only then this becomes invertible. But also, you know, statistically speaking, we want to avoid overfitting when H is too large, right? I, even the, when it's dense in L2, because then the projection on the, on the closure of, 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 of the embedding is just F itself. Okay, so now I, I, I just state three theorems which summarize the main analytical facts related to this optimization problem. And, it, you know, first of all, you know, the, norm, the normal equation, right? First order condition, okay? Uh, so H is a solution if and only satisfies this normal equation. And so from this, we immediately see that as soon as JJ star, J star J plus lambda is invertible, there, is, there exists a unique solution. And that's the content of the following theorem. Um, um, so if this is invertible, which again holds if and only if either lambda is strictly positive or you know, J has a zero kernel and H is finite dimensional, or both of them. Um, and in this case, there exists a unique solution we denoted by H lambda. Um, now, you know, this H lambda turns out to be in the, in the range of, in the image of J star in the image of J star. So there exists a G here in L2 so that H is, in, is J star of G. And here comes our representer theorem, right, again, right? So that's the representer theorem from, from kernel-based learning, if you like, in, in, in theory, right? Now this G here solves uh, this optimization problem down here. That's the optimization problem that we will actually solve in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sample-based learning, right? It's, it's, this comes from here. All right. Uh, now, you know, this has an important application for our financial problem, right? Namely, this gives us a decomposition of our approximation here, a decomposition into basis functions kx. Now, if each of these basis functions kx has a closed form conditional expectation, then the sum, the integral of them, also has. And that's, that's the content of this uh, corollary, right? So if each, you know, if each of these kx has a closed form conditional expectation for any t, then also our you know, approximating function will have that feature, okay? So that would solve our computation problem for the approximation. Good, I skip that. Um, yeah, that's, the, you know, that's about g here, how to solve g. Uh, how to solve this problem again? There is a first order. There is a normal equation to this one, and it turns out that you know this normal. Uh, that's that's what we will solve in the sample in the sample version, right? Because what what we do in the sample version? Sorry, I switch back and forth. But what we do in the sample version is we will actually solve this problem, but for the empirical measure nu x. Okay. <coughs> Uh, a closed form, um, I give you examples, but think of k being, let's say, exponential and, or polynomial, and think of x being a Gaussian IID. Well, then we have closed form conditional expectations. Yes, that I, I have, but then mu can be complicated. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the integral, yeah, yeah. So it's closed form, yeah, I see. It's closed form to the extent that it, it, it still amounts to an integral. Now, this integral in the empirical, in the sample version, will be a sum, will be a finite sum. True. But it's as closed form as what we call in affine processes, you know, closed form, whenever we speak about the, um, the, the, the characteristic function, which itself is given a solution to some Riccati ODEs, etc. So, okay. Now, just quickly about, you know, lambda, what about lambda equals zero, right? When lambda is zero, then as I said, right? So the F zero would be the projection on the, on the, on the, on the closure of the embedding of H, which of course itself always exists, but it's only an element in the image of J, if and only if the, origin, the problem that I showed you has a solution for lambda equals to zero. Um, now, you know, due to orthogonality, we can decompose then this approximation error, right? into what we would call a best approximation error plus a regularization error, right? Of course, this regularization brings, has its cost, right? It, 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 it introduces an additional error due to the regularization, right? So we would want to have lambda as small as possible, but then, of course, again, not too small, right? Because, uh, but, you know, the question, of course, here would be, first of all, you know, does f lambda go to f0 at all when lambda goes to 0? Right? That's a question to ask, and the answer is yes. It always does, right? But this conversion can be slow, okay? But it does. Uh, it will be faster, uh, it will be of order squared of lambda as soon as F0 itself is in the image of J, and it will be even of the order lambda if, uh, if F0 itself is in the image of JJ star. Good, um, here is a, Here's the idea. So for a finite dimensional reproducing kernel Hilbert space, whenever you know, the kernel is of this form, this is always a, a, a kernel. What is that? Phi here is a vector of functions. We have m functions. We assume they're linearly independent. Uh, we stack them into a vector. Uh, th this gives us a feature map. It's a map from E to Rm. We take the inner product of phi with itself in x and y, and that is a kernel function. It turns out that the reproducing kernel Hilbert space has these phi's as an autonormal basis. Uh, and so we can you know, represent uh, every function by, by a column vector with respect to these bases. And so we can represent the, 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 the operator j star j as, as a matrix, right? The gram matrix. Bon. So the two generic situations that we will uh, that I ha we have in mind here is indeed right. So either the dimension of H is finite, like here, um, and then you know, and then we we would not necessarily need the lambda. We could just turn switch the, the lambda to zero. We would have to leave with the approximation error. Right. That's our bias. Um, in turn, if, if the other extreme is if H is densely in, embedded in L2, then we know that F lambda uh, converges to F0, which is equal to F, as we let lambda go to zero. We don't know how fast this goes, but it, it goes to zero. So, so we will, of course, have to stop at some lambda positive, uh, but which will result in some approximation error. But I just want to highlight that you know either way, we will have an approximation error. Okay. Good. Now, time is running. Uh, I speak about sample estimation. The good thing is now uh, that there is nothing new. For the sample estimation, all I do, all we have to do is we have now replaced the measure new by the empirical measure that we obtain from a finite sample. And then all the theorems, everything we saw just applies one to one, and we get everything. You know, we get the, 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 the approximation of F, but now of F seen as an element in the L2 space with respect to the empirical measure, but we still get an approximation of that F, you know, by an element in our representing kernel Hilbert space. Okay. And, and then what remains is to show that when the sample size goes to infinity, you know, that this, this, this sample estimator uh, actually converges 
to the true to the true approximation. So that that's you know that's in a nutshell the content, and and the rest is you know writing it up properly, right? So. You know, there are some technical assumptions. First of all, we, we assume now that the original problem is well posed. The approximation exists, right, H lambda. Uh, we, have, we, we need a bit of more higher order moments, conditions here. And now we learn this approximation from a finite sample. So we, OK, I mean, but what do we do? We need a finite sample. So we, we take the product space of E, of uh, you know, the product measure, bold phase nu. Uh, we let x be, you know, iid, e-valued random variables, copies of x. Uh, this gives rise to an empirical measure, and then all results that we show on the scene on the, in, in the last section just apply. Uh, to highlight a bit the difference, we denote then still the jx, the embedding of h into the empirical L2 space by jx, which this is just a sample version of j, okay? And then to shorten, to lighten the notation a bit, I now call this integral operator j star j by a, and j x star j x by a x. Okay, so that the, the the sample estimators for h lambda and f lambda, right, are now h x, which is a x plus lambda inverse j x star f, and f x is just the embedding of h x into into the L two space. So here, you know, I, I give you a figure here, right? So, so this here is, you know, so that's the triangle we saw before, right? H, the integral operator, j star j, here's our L2 space, the target space, the target function f, okay? Now we add the empirical counterpart to it, L2, new x. We have jx, j star x, and, you know, the integral operator on h, just the empirical counterpart. We have our target function f, which is a function by nature, but we can view it as an element in L2 nu, but we can also view it as an element in L2 nu x. We just see f now as an element in L2 nu x. That means we just have to evaluate f in, in these finitely many sample points. Uh, we, we map, in both cases, we map f into h by applying j star x to f and by applying j star to f. That's an element in H. Now, you know, the good thing is that now we let the sample size go to infinity or increase the sample size. Uh, you know, of course, these spaces L2 here would, would change all the time. But of course, what remains is the, is the reproducing kernel Hilbert space H. We just have a family of operators, AX, and we have to, sh we, 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 can, we can prove that AX converges to A, actually in a very strong sense, in a Hilbert-Schmidt sense. Okay, so from it, you know, we, from it, AX converges to A. From it, we can show AX plus lambda inverse converges to A plus lambda inverse. We can also show that J star X F converges to J star F in H, right? And then combining the things, we can show that, you know, the empirical, the sample estimator HX converges to the true approximation H lambda. So that's the program, okay? How to compute HX? As that's on the previous slide. Um, well, here it is, right? So we have these, we have, you know, we, we, we solve, we use this representative theorem. We solve for the function g in, L, in the empirical, in the sample version of L2, right? Uh, so we need, you know, L2 nu x. Now, this is a finite dimensional space. J, the integral operator, j star x, j jx, j star x, has, has a matrix representation. And this matrix representation is just given by the, by the kernel matrix, i.e. the matrix that we obtain by, uh, 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 by plugging in uh, the samples into, into the kernel function. And then we scale it by 1 over n. So that's the matrix representation. And then, you know, and then that's, that's just uh, the, you know, the corollary of the theorem we saw about you know, computing g. Right? If, if 1 over k plus lambda is invertible, then, you know, and then, you know, then, then there is a unique solution. G here is a vector now. F is just a vector of, of, the, of, the, of the values. And that gives us hx. Look at that. And now that's closed form, right? 
So, so you know, these guys will have closed form conditional expectations when we plug in capital X here. It's a finite sum, so we get a finite sum of closed form, you know, of, of closed form conditional expectations. So that's that's what we will, in the end, work with. Of course, if if you know if H is finite dimensional, we can also look at the other ways of doing. But you know, this is kind of the canonical way to do. Um, good. So we can compute it. Uh, we have all the tools to show that you know the things converge. Uh, I, I, I just highlight uh, the, the the main the main results that we get. Um, there is a little bit more on the slides than I can actually talk you through uh, during this uh, this remaining time. So let's just focus on the case when lambda is positive. Right on the regularized case, uh, because you know everything is formulated so that it also applies to lambda equals zero, which of course would enforce H to be finite dimensional. But we combined we combined two um, in, in 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 one in one uh, frame. So if lambda is positive, then we can we can estimate uh, the, the well. We have an upper bound for the mean sample error. Right here's the sample error. So it's a true approximation minus the, the sample estimator of the approximation. Uh, we can bound the mean L, no, uh, uh, the mean H norm uh, by you know something divided by one over square root of n. So it's order one over square root of n. Of course, it's that's what Monte Carlo also gives us. There is no miracle. Uh, we have. Uh, a central limit theorem, we have a lot of large numbers in the function space. So this, this gives us, uh, um, you, know, um, you know, we have, we have, a, we have a variance, uh, covariance operator. Um, and, you know, knowing that, you know, the central limit theorem applies, then we know that asymptotically for large sample size, the sample error is centered Gaussian with a covariance operator, uh, which is uh, order one over n. And then the large deviation principle for Gaussian random variables tells us that asymptotically for large radius, you know, this is how the, the tail distribution of the sample error behaves. It goes exponential minus tau square n. Now this is asymptotic. Now the cool thing is that we get a finite sample version of this by using concentration inequality. Okay. Finite sample version. Uh, however, we have to assume boundedness. We have to assume a bounded kernel. We have to assume the payoff function essentially bounded. <laughs> then, again, just focus on the positive lambda case. Then the tail distribution of the sample error has, you know, this exponential minus tau square behavior. For finite sample, this is this is guaranteed. So this is for finite. This is for any finite n now. So that's one way to read it. The other way to read it is, of course, to fix the tau. Let's say you you're fine with an error of one percent, and then this tells you that you know the probability that your error is larger than one percent goes exponentially fast now in n. And now this is exponentially fast in n. This is of course much better than the Monte Carlo type of you know one over square root of n. Order, right? The cost, of course, is we have to buy. We have to buy is that we need to assume bounded kernel and bounded payoff function. Now, financial payoff functions are not bounded typically. Okay, so there is a last element that, that that I need to contribute here, and this is a, a, a sampling, a, a weighted sampling scheme. So here's a weighted sampling scheme. So here's, a, you know, I, I give it now in the context of our portfolio risk management or financial application again. So instead of, you know, as, so, so we change the measure. I, I give you a picture here, look. Um, let's say our original, let's say our financial uh, uh, payoff uh, function, you know, is in L2 with respect, you know, to the distribution of X, which we call now mu. Uh, it, it's possible to find a clever way to, to basically change the measure um, and find a bounded kernel so that upstairs, right, under the changed measure, everything that I showed you so far applies. Um, and that gives us, you know, that gives us a sample estimator, 
which has the same qualities as the one that I showed you on the previous, in the previous section. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the concentration inequality kicks in. And we have closed form uh, uh, conditional expectations. And then, you know, in the last two minutes, uh, I just show you an example. Um, it is based on the choice of a Gaussian exponentiated kernel. And it is based on um, discrete time Black Scholes model. Very simple now, simple as possible, two periods uh, to have some path dependence. Uh, and let's look at, you know, some, I mean, there's a bunch of options we, we, we implemented. Up and out call is path dependent. This is a call that pays you the, 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 the payoff if and only if the running maximum has not breached a certain barrier. That's path dependent. Um, okay. And so, you know, we, we implement that. We compare it to uh, nested Monte Carlo. And so here's what we find. Just focus on the up and out call again. Uh, what this table shows you in, in short is the relative L1 error of the replicating martingale at any time point. We have three time points, 0, 1, and 2. <laughs> it's the relative L1 error. So here's the relative one error at time 0. This is what you get for uh, uh, Monte Carlo. This is what you get for uh, our kernel-based method without the weighting scheme. And if we wait, then we, we have an error of, you know, below 1%. Uh, that's for the unconditional expectation. For the conditional expectation, uh, we get, we get uh, nested Monte Carlo error. And that is, that is significantly reduced by, by doing kernel method um, using, using the weighting. And, and the important thing is that this is done with a very small sample. We only use 2,000 sample points. And of course, we use the same sample size for the nested Monte Carlo to have a fair comparison. Right? All right, that uh, brings me to the concluding slide. So um, I presented you here a computational framework uh, for you know, all purposes you know, that, that may, uh, f you know, that may uh, arise in, in the context of quantitative portfolio risk management. Uh, it's machine learning with kernels. Uh, and it gives accurate estimates of the replicating portfolio for relatively small training sample size, i.e., again, you know, facing uh, limited uh, computing, um, um, let's say, uh, capacity. We have weighted sampling scheme, further improves results, and, you know, there is, of course, work in progress. Uh, just mentioning a few, we, we, we developed a life insurance industry application, i.e., the replicating portfolio. This First examples here can, of course, be scaled up to larger sample sizes. We can include parameter dependence, and then, you know, in the end, apply it to stochastic optimal control. Thank you for your attention. Say it again. We could we could approximate it by using so I'm by using yeah by just the last sentence by using what polynomials. Polynomials. Okay. Well, it it it's there. It's part of that con right. It's part of that. So so if you use polynomials, um, then um, 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 then you're here, right? So you say. Use, use some basis functions. Polynomials is your choice. You can use polynomial exponential functions. Uh, pick any of your favorite functions. Pick finitely many of them. You know, stuck them into a feature map. And you know, all you do there in regression is the same as, as, as doing uh, kernel based. That's here. So the advantage or, or the point we want to make here is that you want to do something which is, you know, this is finite dimensional, so we will always end up with a, with a, with a projection gap. But, you know, if this reproducing kernel hyperspace is, 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 is large, and, and then we can go arbitrarily close to the true function, to the target function. 
Uh, and of course, that's and the advantage of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space approach, the kernel method, is that you know the dimensionality, the effective dimensionality that you are applying is actually the same as the sample size, right? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the answer. I have a second question. So, the second question is why not directly approximate the dt instead of the pair of function? Well, that would basically mean you have to first fix t, right? You say for a given t, you want to approximate vt. Vt, yes. Yes. Vt is a conditional expectation. It's a conditional expectation. So you fix t, and then, of course, you say, well, because it's a conditional expectation, uh, you know, it's orthogonal to everything which is, you know, I mean, right? Or, so it's enough to project on functions which are functions of the first uh, little t uh, Gaussian, you know, of the Brownian motion up to little t. Uh, you can do that, but, but okay, it, ha it has two major caveats. So, so the first one is, I mean, you, you have to do it t by t, okay? While this approach gives you all t in one wash, okay? And the other thing is, and I didn't have the time to discuss that too much, but it's somewhere, I mean, it, because it's buried in, 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 in one of these <laughs> corollaries, um, which, which came out of the, of the central limit theorem. It's actually here. It's, it's in a sense, it's, it's, it's let's say, if, if, the interest, if you're only interested in, in the unconditional expectation, right? Then you could just run a, a simple Monte Carlo, and, and uh, right? And then, you know, average the samples that gives you a Monte Carlo estimator. Um, this here uh, tells you that you can also just learn f by fx and then integrate fx. And this tells you that doing this is better because the Monte Carlo error is now smaller. The Monte Carlo error that you commit is proportional to the projection distance or do the projection error. And of course, if you do directly just naive Monte Carlo, that means you, you project on the function one. But if you project on more functions on a larger space, then this error will become smaller. So that's, in short, the answer to that. Thanks for your answer. Okay, this is not a My good question. question. <laughs> <laughs> but any other questions? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd like to, to talk more, like, not a lot more, about the reinforcement learning application of this. Like the, you mentioned the stochastic control, right? So I mentioned, yeah, OK. I, I can make it short. I mentioned the stochastic optimal control, but I didn't mention reinforcement learning. But, uh, do you think that this could go into this? It's not, no, it's not reinforcement learning. No. It's dynamic programming. Yeah. Dynamic programming, compute conditional expectations. Yeah, and reinforcement learning would be the, the variant of this where you learn your optimal state yeah, yeah, data. But, so then if you, if you practice this, could be applied yes. to approximation yes. and if you learn the value function as you go along and get more data, then I presume that this could also go into that direction. Yeah, that, that's not a priori what, what, what we had in mind, but, but I mean, the, I that's certainly worthwhile to think about. Okay. Any other uh, short question? Yes. So if I was sort of to go to your back, first slides, I, you, had a, you had a fixed capital T. This was the, 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 the horizon which, of course, determines the, the measure mu. So, so, so my question is, do we understand anything about sensitivity of uh, the approximation, particularly Ax, with respect to mu? So, so the measure that's used to generate the samples. So if my, my capital horizon t was slightly off, then the variance of my Gaussian noise would change. Yeah. Can I extrapolate once I did you know, the approximation for, for one year? Can I can I understand the yeah. features in over a year? Yeah. That, that's what I mentioned on the last slide with the, with the parameter. Sorry for that. Uh, that's uh, that what I had in mind with the inclusion of parameters. Right, you have you have model. I mean, it's not it's not uncertainty, of course, in the strict sense that the way you do it. Uh, but you know, we, we could have. But the, I mean, to the extent that you, it's Bayesian, you can do it. You know, you you introduce parameters that would reflect that. Uh, you do a Bayesian ansatz, and then you learn you learn just you, exactly. 